Good evening. We welcome you to our live stream service tonight from Southport Christian Center in National City. We're so glad that you have joined us and we look forward to these times with you and just trust that this will be the highlight of your week as we anticipate celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ this Sunday. Tonight we have a wonderful study in the book of Acts, so get your Bibles ready and after a time of worship we will go to Acts chapter 12. If you have a need tonight, would you agree with me in prayer as we pray that it will be met during this service. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the faithfulness of your word, your love, your care. Thank you for the privilege we have of coming into your presence anytime we need to, Lord. We cannot live without you. And we come tonight, Lord, with those that are believing for a miracle, a miracle of healing or salvation or deliverance or whatever is needed, Lord. We just agree in prayer with him at this very moment that that will take place in their lives and they will be changed because of having tuned in tonight. Thank you for the power of prayer and the power of your word, Lord. We give this time to you. We ask that you will be glorified and honored as we sing worship and praise. And as we turn to the study of your word, feed us, Lord, for we are hungry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now let's join Ruth and David and Gary and Cosad as we worship the Lord together. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being moved. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. Bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. Set our hearts on you. Come and do. Oh 
cross we've thought of that a lot this week haven't we as we are heading toward the end of this week and preparing for the resurrection for the resurrection came the crucifixion and what a wonderful hope that brought to the world we'll take your bible tonight and let's turn to acts chapter 12 we're going to talk about the power of herod versus the power of prayer and this is an amazing chapter tonight as we look into god's word Luke is in the process of transitioning from Peter as the central figure in the book of Acts to Paul. Tonight we go back to Peter for the last time, except for a brief appearance that he makes in chapter 15, a few years later. Actually, chapter 12 is a flashback. After the church planting in Antioch in chapter 11, it could have started, meanwhile in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul are bringing the love gift for the poor in the Jerusalem church, and no further information is given in their ministry activity. At the end of this chapter, it simply says they went back to Antioch. So chapter 12's key lesson is the power of prayer. It's the power of a reigning monarch pitted against the power of prayer to the Almighty. Verse 1 says this, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Who was Herod the king? Herod was the surname of a family of rulers who served under the emperor of Rome. Three Herods are mentioned in the New Testament. There was Herod the Great who had the babies killed when Jesus was born. There was Herod Antipas the one that ordered the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And this one, Herod Agrippa I, is the grandson of Herod the Great. To complete the picture, his son, Herod Agrippa II, is the one that is called King Agrippa before whom Paul presented his case to defend himself in Acts 25. He was not known as Herod, but Agrippa. Persecution did not seem to be an issue in Jerusalem after the death of Stephen. The circumcision issue had seemingly become a non-issue, and peace reigned for a while. Years later, in Acts 15, the Pharisees would bring it up again. But in the days of Herod the king, something else had changed. Peter's ministry in the house of Cornelius had become a major issue and the beginning of serious trouble among other Jews in Jerusalem. The apostles had come to accept Peter's decision and agreed with him, but it was at that time that Herod began to harass the church. Verse 2 says, Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. This is the James that had been part of Jesus' inner circle. Peter, James, and John were often mentioned but it did not, he did not seem to have a prominent role in the Jerusalem church. The James, who later became a high-profile church leader, was the brother of Jesus himself. Why Herod singled James out, we're not certain. He was an apostle and perhaps a safer target than Peter as a recognized leader. Herod undoubtedly contrived some charge against him and ordered his execution. He was killed with a sword, beheaded instead of stoned. Verse 3, And because he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now this took place during the days of unleavened bread. Verse 4, So when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, 
and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him out before the people after Passover. Verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the doors were keeping the prison. Killing James had turned out to be a good political move for Herod. He saw that it pleased the Jews, and now he would go for Peter. He was on a roll. Pleasing the Jews was a high value for Herod because, strangely enough, according to Jewish law, he had no right to be the king of the Jews. His family were Jewish proselytes, Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. He had married a Jewish woman and wanted to be seen as a full Jew. Herod Agrippa I, who had just killed James, was under the same stigma. As a good proselyte, Herod, of course, had been circumcised, kept the Jewish law, observed the, the Passover, and offered sacrifices in the temple. He knew his position was precarious, so whenever he could, he did something special to please the Jews. Now that he had killed James, he would go after Peter. Murder seems so drastic to us, but not to the family of Herod. Killing of the babies, John the Baptist, and many others that they considered to be troublemakers was a mark of their reigns. John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to kill, steal, and destroy. The force of darkness was waging war against the kingdom of God as it was spreading throughout the world. It would have been a severe blow to the church to lose its leader and another apostle. So Herod decided to arrest Peter during the days of unleavened bread. Perhaps he chose this time because there were many Jews in Jerusalem for the feast and they could see what he had done to avoid anything that could go wrong with his plan. Herod took extraordinary measures of security. He put four squads of soldiers assigned at his four at a time on six hour shifts. Peter was bound to two of them with a chain on each side. Finally, guards were placed in front of the prison doors. Maximum security. Why such drastic measures? Experience. Peter had been in jail twice before, once while he was awaiting trial, and then secondly with all of the apostles when an angel had come and brought them all out and the guards were totally unaware of what had happened. This time, Herod was sure no angel could get past all of his guards and definitely no angel could break the chains. Verse five, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. This is the key verse in chapter 12. It is the but God verse. It shows the cause and effect that happens when believers pray. Constant prayer indicates intense intercession, such as Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, where he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, and an angel came to strengthen him. In intense prayer, time seems to stand still. The Holy Spirit comes in unusual ways, and there's a high degree of intimacy with the Father and an assurance that our prayer has been heard and acted upon in the heavenlies. It was this kind of prayer that was taking place for Peter in Mary's house. Her son, John Mark, was a close friend of Peter's. Does intercessory prayer work? Oh yes, it does. It changes things. It does not change the nature of God. Matthew 21, 22 says, and all things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Prayer and believing faith go hand in hand. In James 5.16, he wrote, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It was that kind of prayer that was taking place at Mary's house that night. Prayer partners are a wonderful blessing. When two or three agree together in prayer, wonderful things happen. 
The believers in Mary's house were in one accord that night, and they were engaged in intense spiritual warfare. Prayer is the chief weapon of spiritual warfare. While Peter was in prison, a high-level power encounter was taking place in the invisible world. You couldn't see it, but it was happening, all because of the power of prayer. Verses 7 through 10 said, Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by Peter, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off of his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. Verse 9. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. Verse 10. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. And it opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and down the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. This is one of the clearest, most visible and tangible activities of an angel in the New Testament. Angels are spiritual beings, and they are immediately present when they have been dispatched from heaven. The Bible is clear from Genesis to Revelation that God does use angels for his purposes. Sometimes they are messengers, like the one that came to tell Mary about the baby she would conceive. Sometimes they deliver things, like the food deliveries for Elijah. They provide protection and they minister to God's people in various ways. It was amazing, <coughs> pardon me, it was amazing that Peter, chained to two soldiers, was peacefully sleeping when the angel arrived. He was not praying or stressing. He was sleeping. His release was so incredible and so sudden, he couldn't believe what was really happening to him. Verse 11, And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod, and from all the expectations of the Jewish people. Peter first thought he was dreaming or seeing a vision, but when he realized it was real, he gave God all the glory. Verse 12, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many people were gathered together praying. Prayer saved Peter's life. The constant prayer of these believers delivered him from prison. Just as it was with Moses' intercession when he was held up by Aaron and Hur, who gave Joshua the victory and moved the hand of God in their behalf. We must never limit God nor lose sight of his power encounters. Daniel experienced such a moment as he waited 21 days for his answer. An angel came, delayed by the prince of Persia, and he needed the help of a stronger angel, Michael, to finally deliver the answer to Daniel. Often we pray and God answers by sending angels to implement his will. We don't always see them, but we are very aware that there has been divine intervention. The forces of darkness use whatever they have to prevent this ministry from taking place. That's why spiritual warfare and prayer is so needed in our day. Prayer is the key to victory every time. We don't know the battle that's ensuing when we pray, so we pray believing that our God hears and answers. So we go back to our story, verse 13 says, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing by the gate. Mm -hmm. And they said to her, you're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting it was so. So they said, it's his angel. Bear with me for a moment. They are praying for Peter's deliverance. God did it. He's standing at the gate, and they can't believe it. Rhoda had no problem believing because she had seen him and she had heard his voice. 
She knew it was him, but she was not believed. Verse 16, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. Were they not expecting God to answer their prayer? Was this too good to be true? I wonder as I wrote those words, do we pray that way sometimes? Do we expect God to answer our prayers? I trust we do. Verse 17, but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. This James is the brother of Jesus, who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And this is the last that we will hear of Peter until his brief reappearance in Acts 15. Herod has no idea of the divine intervention that has taken place in his prison. So verses 18 and 19 said, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had happened to prison to Peter because none of them had witnessed it either. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. By losing his chance to execute Peter, Herod had lost big time. The Jews had all been invited to Peter's execution, and his escape was a public embarrassment for Herod, and the soldiers must all die to pay for it. But God wasn't through with Herod. The worst was yet to come. Verse 20, now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So on a set day, he arrayed himself in royal apparel, sat on his throne, and gave an oration. And the people kept shouting, it's the voice of a god and not of man. Then immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. He made the same mistake Lucifer made when he said, I will be like the Most High. Herod served the creature rather than the creator. He did have the voice of a god, but it was a small g, and he died a horrible death. But the very next verse says, the word of God grew and multiplied. When demonic obstacles are cleared away, the church can grow. Acts chapter 12 opens with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphing. The chapter ends with Herod dead, Peter set free, and the word of God triumphing. Amen? Amen. Our God reigns. Oh, what a joy it is to know the power of prayer. I trust that you have experienced that in your life. When God's prayer when reaches him, he acts. He hears the cry of his people. He moves in their behalf. Do you know the Lord tonight? Have you ever invited Jesus to be in your home, in your heart? He died and rose again to bring salvation to everyone who believes. I trust that you know him in that way. And if you don't, I trust that you will open your heart as we pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your precious word that tonight has declared the power of prayer. How much you want your people to use that gift, Lord. That power that brings heaven to earth and fixes the problems and the hurts and the pains that we have. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you most of all for dying for our sins and being our Savior. And tonight, Lord, I want to come with that one that's receiving you for the first time or that one that's coming back to you, Lord, that's grown a little cold in their heart and they would like to renew that relationship. I ask that you will hear their prayer tonight as they confess their sins and invite you to be the Lord and Savior in their lives. We give you praise tonight as you come into their hearts and abide there by your Holy Spirit and accomplish your work in their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight and for your faithful love and prayers and support of this ministry. We love you and miss you and pray for you. Please join us this Sunday for a very special day. 
as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior at 1030. It will be live streamed and it will be in person and we invite you to come and be there. Come and enjoy amazing worship, communion at the Lord's table and the ministry of the word. And come at 10 o'clock for coffee and juice and pastries. There will be special activities for your children as well. There will be food on Fridays at 10 and Friday at 7, there's a very special youth service. They're going to have a glow-in-the-dark egg hunt. And they will have a time of food and fellowship and study in God's Word. On Saturday at 10 o'clock, we also offer a box lunch. On Monday is our prayer night. We gather with our family in our home, and we invite you to do the same thing. And every Tuesday at 10 o'clock, Ruth's ladies come and receive a Bible outline and then there is also food available on that day. And then next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we invite you to join us for another live stream service where we're studying the book of Acts and we'll worship together. This week, will you celebrate the joy and the truth of the risen Savior? I trust that he will be very real to you and we will look forward to seeing you on Sunday. God bless you and thank you again for joining us tonight.